Thank you so much, Pastor Dave and Sobel Beach Christian Fellowship. It's a really a great privilege for my wife Sherry and I to be with you again. Uh, we've been here over the last couple decades upon occasion, but in the last three years, I think we've been here now three times. And three years ago, it was at the time your building project was in the dream stage and you were still voting and discerning and prayerfully deciding if this was the direction to go or not. And what a joy for Sherry and I as we pulled into the parking lot arriving yesterday and saw all of the bricks taken off the side of the building and piled at the side. And I said, this is a smart congregation. They're recycling these bricks, taking the time to take them down. And this morning I went uh, to where there was some rubble there and I picked up one of the bricks because I just wanted to get a feel of what, a little bit of what you're doing. Uh, although those of you that took all the bricks off, I, you probably feel a little bit sore. Uh, but for me, I just wanted to grab one of those bricks and get a feel for what you're doing. And I affirm it, I encourage you, and I pray that God will, will prosper you in your work. He'll give you strength for the task that lies ahead, joy on the journey, and that you'll be able to rejoice as you see God using you, continuing to use you to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to this community, and then through your corporate efforts as a congregation and together with the broader church uh, that you'll see that good news spread around the world. Uh, the last time that my wife and I were here was in October, as David mentioned. It was with, with Luis Hernandez and his wife, Janaisi. And I want to bring some greetings from him this morning. Luis is the president of the BIC Church in Cuba. Uh, and when he was here last October, it was a number of firsts for Luis and for his wife, Janaisi. It was the first time they had ever experienced snow and they enjoyed going, I believe, out this door in between the two services and trying to catch some snowflakes on their tongues. And it was also the first opportunity that Luis had to speak in a Canadian congregation, a Canadian church family, a Canadian BIC church. And so he found it a little bit stressful. He was a little bit nervous coming, uh, but he loved it. He, he had a fantastic time, he and his wife with you, to the degree that when I told him I was returning today, he said, hey, if you need any help with the sermon... Just give me a call, and he would have been more than glad uh, to jump on a plane and to be with us this morning. So greetings, love and greetings from Luis and from his wife, Janaisi. And I also want to bring greetings from other dear friends in Cuba. Uh, this is a family that says, although we have not met you, we love you and we feel like we have known you all of our lives. This is Pastor John and his wife, Anisle, and their two children, Josue and Haziel. John and Anisle are church planters that your church sponsors uh, in Cuba, planting a church in the province of Sancti Spiritus. As Dave mentioned, I'm a work part-time for Bit Canada Global, and so I have the, the wonderful privilege of being in contact with people who are serving as an extension of the BIC Church around the world. And over the last number of months, Pastor Jawan receives the prize. He's the number one communicator with me to send me updates and pictures of what God is doing in their local church. So he sends me pictures, he sends me little updates of what's happening, and I try to put them together and translate them into English and then send them on to Pastor David. But the number one thing that in all of the WhatsApp messages and text messages and emails that Jawan sends me, the number one thing that he repeats in just about every message is, we are praying for you and don't stop praying for us. Now I think that John believes, uh, almost thinks like I'm a member of the Sobel BIC church because he knows I'm the link between you and them. And he's never been to Canada, so he doesn't know how far apart we live. And so when he writes and he says, we're praying for you, he's thinking of, of you, us, all of us together. And he says, please don't stop praying for us. It was a week ago Saturday, not last Saturday, but not yesterday, but the week before. Uh, I'd been in bed sleeping. We'd been resting for about an hour. It was after 11 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, my phone started going ding, and another 10 seconds later, ding, another 10 seconds later, ding, and the WhatsApp program, uh, where often Joanne sends messages, every time a message comes in, it makes a ding, and even when it's on silent, the phone still dings a little warning. And so they had the church planting that you're sponsoring in Cuba was just finishing a prayer vigil. It was after 11 o'clock at night, and Joan wanted to send me pictures right away. He says, we're just concluding this prayer vigil, and he says, we want you to know that we prayed for you. I did explain to him, I said, wow, thank you so much. I appreciate all you're doing. I appreciate your prayers. But after 10 o'clock, I'm usually sleeping, 
and the phone dings when you write the messages, and so you could try to send them a little earlier. But just think, while most of us were sleeping, you have dear brothers and sisters in your family who are praying for you. They're praying for us. And so please know that this family is sending their loving greetings to you this morning as well. Pastor Dave explained to me that you are in the midst of a five-week series of sermons on the subject of evangelism. I listened in online to some parts of those sermons to get a sense of what you've been talking about. And I believe God has been shaping your thoughts and your actions as you have studied evangelism principles from 2 Corinthians chapters 2 to 5. And you've been learning what it means to face your fears and follow Jesus. You've been learning how to be like diffusers, spreading the aroma of Christ, how to let your light shine as ambassadors for Jesus, and understanding that you are like love letters written by Jesus and sent out into the world. All of that and more has been framed by the sermon series title, Into Dark Corners. And that title just underscores the fact that God has called us to go. He has sent us out on mission, given us that great commission to go out into all the world and to bring the gospel, serving as his hands and feet and his voice. And God calls us to follow him on that mission, the mission that he began. He took the initiative in it. He did all that was needed to, to bring salvation to this planet, and he invites us to carry on his mission, bringing the gospel into the world, bringing light into the dark, like living lighthouses, lighthouses that have legs and arms and heads and voices going out to show people the way to be saved. And I believe this is what you've been up to. This is what you have been doing here at Sauvel. You are a beacon of hope on Lake Huron, and it shines out across the globe. It's what you've been doing, and I want to encourage you to do it more and more. I want you to continue to be motivated in mission. And a lot of people, when they talk about mission ministry, sometimes they talk about, talk about compassion ministries. And so I long and pray that you will continue to have passion in your compassion. I want to encourage you not to lose heart serving the Lord and sharing his love. I want to encourage you to not lose steam shining the light of God's love into the dark places. Because this is a very real danger for all of us as followers of Christ, to simply lose our motivation for mission, to become lukewarm in our faith so much that the thought of missions and working together to get the gospel spread out into the world might become as exciting as sitting down to eat a plate of cold mashed potatoes with no butter, with no salt, and with no pepper. It is a tactic of the devil, I believe, to frustrate God's mission on earth to take, by taking the passion out of our compassion ministries to extinguish the fire of our desire to follow Jesus earnestly and to do his will. And if we're not careful, we become tired, indifferent, disengaged, distracted from what matters most. I want to show you a picture. I can turn behind me. Yeah, that's the picture I want you to see. Does that kind of give you a deflated feeling? It's not a very fun picture to see. If you're on a trip and that happens, uh, you don't feel very excited. What is this? So this is, this is a flat tire, a very flat tire. This, what you're seeing, is us. This is us if we lose our passion for mission. If our compulsion loses propulsion, our compulsion to love God and our neighbors. This is us if our motivation and mission springs a slow leak and wanes. This is us if God says go and we say no. Motivation in missions is so important. If our mission lacks motivation, it's like having a flat tire in our faith. We're not going to get far until we change it. Wise vehicle owners will do regular maintenance to ensure their vehicles run well and get them where they need to go. And mission Sundays like this Sunday that you've had year after year for the last number of years do something similar for the church. 
It's a chance to check in and check up on our lives and on our church to ensure that we're running the Christian race well and that we are getting where God wants us to go. At a deep level, that requires some motivation. A very basic level, the motivation to get up out of bed and to rise and shine and, and for you get, to get here to church on a Sunday, that's, that's just at the very minimal level of motivation. But it, when we talk about missions, missions will not happen unless we are motivated and allow God to spur us on into service. So as we kick our mission tires this morning, I pray that if any of them are a little low on motivation, that God will top them up. And in the midst of the chapters of the Bible that you have been studying these last few weeks in the sermon series, Into Dark Corners, there is a key verse that I would like to highlight for today's message that addresses the critical need for mission motivation. And it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. It's a verse that's so short and concise that I think just about all of us could memorize it without any difficulty. That verse says, Christ's love compels us. Christ's love compels us. And this is the takeaway I want you to have from the service today, is to be compelled by Christ's love in mission. What is the air in the tires of our faith that will carry us forward in mission? It's Christ's love. Christ's love in us that carries us forward into dark corners. The love that God has demonstrated to us fuels us in mission and inspires us to share his love around the corner and around the world. Christ's love compels us to partner in mission across the street and across the ocean. It motivates us to do what we can with all that we have, with all of our heart, with all of God's help, in partnership with God's people to share the light of his love in the dark. Christ's love compels us. The decision to follow Jesus and live by faith can be compared to inviting Jesus to take the wheel. If you have the car imagery or your vehicle imagery in your mind this morning, you can imagine when you said, Jesus, take leadership of my life. I put my faith in you. It's like inviting Jesus to take the wheel of your life, to let him steer and give direction. And we start singing that country song, Jesus, take the wheel. I wonder how many people have invited Jesus to take the wheel of their lives, but then they keep a foot firmly pressed on the brake. We say, Jesus, take the wheel, steer me where you want to go, help me to let the light shine, to be the aroma of Christ in the world, to make a difference in my community and world, but, but not so fast. Jesus, you take control of the wheel, but I am going to ride the brakes. How does that work out? Not so well. God might steer you all he can, but if you have the brakes on, you're not going anywhere far or anywhere fast. With the brakes on, we lose motivation and mission. When the brakes are on, we lose sight of the vision God has to bring light into the dark corners through us. When the brakes go on, they drain the passion from our compassion. And so my encouragement to all of you today is a caution. The same caution a driving instructor might give some of you who are 16 and taking driver's classes, or your mechanic might give you, or Jesus Christ himself might tell you. Don't ride the brakes. Let Christ's love compel you and propel you forward in mission, bringing light into the dark corners. It's something we can all do individually, through our network of relationships in our family, our school, in our work, in our neighborhood. It's something you do in partnership with your local church family, in partnership with local mission agencies and nonprofit agencies. And it's something we do globally on a larger scale as we partner with brothers and sisters around the world in mission. My prayer is that you be motivated in mission, and I hope to give a little bit more inspiration to you this morning simply by sharing some stories of what God has been doing around the world as you have engaged with him in mission through your church family. The stories come from Cuba and Nepal. 
I'm going to start with a map of Cuba. You'll see, I think, on the screen. And this is a country that worked hard to extinguish Christianity to the degree that even Christmas was banned from 1969 to 1998. 29 years without Christmas. It's a long time. It was long enough that a whole generation of Cubans grew up without knowing the story of Jesus' birth celebrated at Christmas. And this is my generation. The people more or less my age were raised in Cuba uh, without exposure to all that Christmas means. The Be in Christ Church, at that time known as the Brethren in Christ Church, sent missionaries to Cuba in 1954. This was before the revolution, the Castro Revolution. And over the years, even when the revolution started, since the Be in Christ Church was registered prior to the revolution, it was permitted to continue to function in the country during the whole season of the revolution that's been happening in Cuba. And the Cuban BIC Church, their vision is Cuba for Christ. They want to see Christ reach into all of the spaces and all of the places across the island. Two years ago, I met with Luis Hernandez, the brother who is here in October, the president of the BIC Church in Cuba. And as we looked at a map of Cuba, and it had pins wherever there were BIC churches across the island, and we observed that there were still a couple of provinces and one special territory that did not have any BIC churches in them. We talked together, we were thinking together, praying together, how can they reach Cuba for Christ? How can we get the gospel into each province across the whole island? And so with that vision in mind, we came up with an idea to perhaps have churches in Canada partner with the BIC Church in Cuba to help them start new churches in these provinces where there were no BIC churches. It was approved by the Cuban BIC Church. It was approved by the Brethren in Christ or the BIC Canada Global Leadership Team here as a vision project. In a vision project, once we have those approved, that doesn't mean that they necessarily will happen. It requires a local church or an individual to say, I would like to support that project. These are not projects that are funded through our shared giving. Uh, they're funded by people who feel passionate about seeing them take place. Your congregation stood up uh, and, and stepped up to the plate to take on this partnership. It's a three-year partnership, a church planting partnership in Cuba sponsoring a Cuban missionary, a Cuban pastor, to travel and move with his family into a new province, and in the case of your church, is the province of Sancti Spiritus, uh, giving $1,500 a year for three years to help to see that happen, a partnership between Canada and Cuba. And it's happening. Uh, you're halfway through this partnership, and already the church planting pastor there is working in three areas. He's working in a place called Hati Bonico, and then there are mission extensions happening five kilometers away in a little town called La Perra, and another, another 14 kilometers away in a place called Yaya. You've also gathered funds. You saw this big check this morning. Uh, beautiful. Thank you for your generosity to help purchase an electric motorcycle uh, for use for, uh, by this missionary in the province of Santa Espiritus, and it, makes, it will make a big difference. He wrote me a week or two ago, he said he's just looking forward to have access to that forms of, form of transportation to increase the radius of their impact in the province. Transportation is super expensive in Cuba. Fuel prices cost about the same as they do here, and a vehicle, if you wanted to buy a car, the, the church there has a 2008 Hyundai Sonata, and they say that vehicle would be worth $100,000 to to buy it if they had to buy it. The government facilitated the church getting that vehicle, uh, but if you went out and wanted to buy one, it would cost like $100,000. So Big Canada Global has approved 15, a project to buy 15 electric motorcycles. Electricity is cheap, and uh, one for each province, and your church is buying one for Sancti Espiritus. Uh, there's a passage in the Bible where the Apostle Paul says, um, pray that the gospel will spread rapidly and be honored. Uh, electric motorcycles will help the gospel to be sped, spread rapidly, and you can join in prayer for this effort in Sancti Espiritus, that the gospel will spread rapidly and be honored. Christ's love is compelling you. Christ's love is compelling the Cuban church to share the love of Christ in the dark places. 
Pastor John wrote a week ago Saturday, and he told me the story of a lady in his church, the church that you are helping to start, and her name is Maria Elena. Maria Elena in English would be Mary Ellen. I'm quoting him what he wrote. He said, recently a lady converted to Christ who had had a very bad life and she had a very bad reputation in society. Her husband had left her and a daughter and was not providing them with any support. She came to the church and God changed her life so much that people in the community didn't even recognize her. She had changed so much. She had tried to commit suicide several times and she had a reputation in a town for punching people. She was hard to get along with. But now, he says, we give thanks to God. She is a changed person. We thank God because this is just one more example of what God is doing among us. Thank you for praying for us. We feel your prayers. We love you and keep planting mission outreaches and spreading the gospel. We love you and ask you to never stop praying for us. We need it. Peace from the church in Sancti Spiritus. We love you, Pastor Juan. Christ's love compelled you to partner in this mission, which is bringing light into a dark corner of the world. And like John, I would say, thank you. I would say, thank God. And let's keep on keeping on, not losing heart, remaining motivated in mission, because God knows the good that will come of it. Last year, the BIC Church in Cuba had a youth conference. Uh, They've had this vision to have a national youth conference, and they decided to hold it in their own facilities because they didn't have enough resources. But there was too many youth, and so they had 200 youth come for three days in their largest uh, facility. They were with them for three days, then those 200 youth left, and another group of 200 came in, and they did another three days. But their vision for this year was to rent a, a large camp where there's room for 500 youth and their leaders to stay. And uh, that's where the project came from, saying, could we help them get some facilities where they could bring 500 youth together at the same time? And thanks to your congregation, I think that dream will be realized this summer. So we'll keep you posted on that as well. But thank you for supporting that mission effort. In addition, this morning, I would like to tell you something that your church is helping to make a reality in the country of Nepal. It's called the Peace Project. And this is a denominational effort. There are some things that we can do as individuals. There are some things we do as a local church. But then there are some things we can accomplish best if we work together with a number of other local churches, which we're doing as a Be in Christ Church of Canada in Nepal. And the PEACE Project stands for Providing Essential Assistance for Children's Education. And every Sunday when you receive an offering here at the church, you have your general fund Uh, and your offerings come together, a portion of that, I think about 10%, is given to our denomination to invest in ministry beyond uh, your local church and together with your church. It's called Cooperative Ministries or Shared Giving. And last year, you gave over $52,000 to shared giving through the Be in Christ Church of Canada. And from those funds that come together from all of our local churches, we're able to do some exciting things in mission, like the Peace Project. I would like you to see a short video that has been put together of what's been happening in this past year and where, where it's going, uh, thanks to your partnership and mission. So, have a look. In rural Nepal, low household incomes of less than $200 a month can often force families to face a heartbreaking decision. It is often a decision between meeting the basic needs of food and housing and providing an education for their children. Fortunately, the Nepal Peace Project aims to provide a way to overcome these barriers by supplying kids with one daily meal, basic medical care, a school uniform each academic year, school supplies, tuition assistance to meet required school fees, tutoring to help with homework, spiritual mentoring and teaching, Our extended BIC family in Nepal wants to see all kids experience the value and benefits of education. So, in partnership with the Be In Christ Church of Canada, they started the Nepal Peace Project, providing essential assistance for children's education. This began in 2018, and they are currently serving the needs of 59 children, 28 girls and 31 boys. 
or in primary schools. The Nepal Peace Project helps kids meet their basic needs in four key areas. Physical, spiritual, social and educational. The program works with children six days a week, either before school in the winter session or after school in the summer session. for two hours each day. The program purposely works out of local churches in the community, helping to increase the connection between the local church with its community. Every day a child spends with family and friends from their own community ensures their ability to receive the best education possible in the safest way possible. The Nepal Peace Project is a wonderful way to assist children with their education in this part of the world, where life can be difficult and accessing education has its own challenges. Please consider giving to the Nepal Peace Project. The program costs $50 per month per child, or $600 a year. This is about the cost of one Tim Hortons coffee each day. These fees cover the costs of all the services provided to the children, including assistance for the staff who teach, mentor and provide food for the children. If you want to consider this investment, visit the Nepal Peace Project donation page. Christ Church of Canada helped the BIC Nepalese Church after the earthquake and currently partners with them in church planting, leadership pastoral development and the Peace Project. Thank you for partnering with us in this important work. We have more information about the Peace Project in the tent, and so when you come over there for a coffee and to visit all the tables, feel free to go by the table set up for BIC Canada Global and find uh, some of that information or a place where you can leave an email address and we can send you some more information about that. I want to mention as well, and you can find these in the tent, that we, uh, the, the partnership that you have with the church in Cuba, there are two other, three other local churches in Canada partnering in church planting partnerships in Cuba. So I'm organizing with Big Canada Global a short-term missions trip to Cuba from October the 5th to the 12th. We'd like representatives from each of the churches, your church and the other two churches I'm targeting because of the provinces where they're working in, where we would go and visit Sancti Spiritus, Pastor Juan and his family, worship with the people there, pray with them. Because this connection, this relation, it's, uh, the, the connection in mission is about relationship as well as us praying here, them praying there and us sending money and getting pictures and updates, we actually think there's great value to having some face-to-face -face contact. So there's information about those, uh, that, that trip. The deadline for applying is the end of this month, so be sure to pick up more information about that in the tent or talk to us out there. Uh, my prayer is that God will continue to propel us forward in effective mission. I encourage people to find ways to invest their energy. We want to invest calories in mission, so you're going to be moving, you're going to be doing things with your life, to make a difference in the world and also to invest your cash. We have the option of saying sometimes we can fund things to help make uh, God's kingdom, the light shine in the dark. So we need to be careful to continue to allow God to propel us forward in mission, uh, to be passionate about the things that matter most. I want to conclude with a picture. I want to show you a picture of a boy named Luis. Joan, uh, the church planting pastor in Sancti Spiritus, sent me this picture and the story behind it only about a week ago. It was at that late night prayer meeting a week ago Saturday when my phone started dinging that this was happening. And he told me about this boy, Luis, who's become a part of the church that's being planted in partnership with you. And he says, this boy is, is just a real special kid. And at that prayer meeting, he's uh, seated in front of a Bible 
And Pastor Joan said, Luis, this boy was crying. He was crying. Why was he crying? You maybe it's not unusual for a six-year-old to cry. Some of you have little kids. They can cry for who knows what. But in this case, the little boy was crying because he does not know how to read. And he really, 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 really wanted to be able to read the Bible. He wanted to, to say, what does this Bible say? And I thought, there's someone who's got conviction and passion to do something. It moved them to tears. Now, as Canadians, sometimes we're not, we're not that emotional. Uh, the people that live in Latin America that I've served with, they say, well, you're from a cold climate. People from a cold climate are just a little bit colder personalities, where people from warm climates are a little bit warmer personalities. They feel things more deeply. And maybe, that's, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But we can't afford, even as cold Canadians, to not be passionate about the things that matter most. And so my challenge, my prayer to you is that you allow God to top up the tires, the motivation for missions, uh, to fill you up with that just conviction and passion to invest your life, your energy, your time, your talents, your creativity, your finances in God's mission to bring the light into the dark places, because that's what matters most. I'd like to lead us in prayer as the worship team is going to be coming to lead us in our closing uh, singing together. So let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved the world so much that you sent Jesus to be the light of the world, to bring the light into the dark. We thank you for shining into our lives, for changing our lives, and then for sending us out with the light, sending us out with your love. Lord, help us to be sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit, giving you free reign, not only of the steering wheel, but of the gas pedal as well. Carry us forward in mission. Carry this beautiful congregation in Sobel forward in mission. Locally, as a local church, through all of their ministries that happen here, in partnership with all of the wonderful organizations that surround them that are ready and willing to help guide ministry out into the community, and then internationally as we partner in mission as well as a denomination and beyond with other organizations, we pray that the good news would spread rapidly and be honored everywhere it goes, just as it is here. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.